Hi, Mary. Hey, Vipin. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing really, really well. Thank you. So good to be with you today. Thank you. Well, welcome back to Upbuilding the Self. Um, for everyone's benefit, M Mary joined the Upbuild team earlier this year. She has been coaching leaders, teams, and organizations for more than 20 years. And she's also been training other coaches for almost that long as well. Um, and we recently kicked off our own Upbuild coaching training program, which Mary, you've been instrumental in designing and leading. And in the context of that program, we felt inspired to share some of the skills that we're teaching with our podcast audience as well, because these skills are applicable to everyone, not just coaches. And I would say not just applicable, but extremely valuable. Yeah, we so, think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, absolutely. And in our last episode, we talked about listening and curiosity and walked through four distinct channels of listening. Today, we're going to talk about a topic that follows naturally from listening and curiosity, which is powerful questions, which also happens to be the second class in our training program. So to start, Mary, what's important about questions? Why are we even talking about this? Well, some of this is the personal bias. I think I love asking questions and I, uh, I have a lot of wonder about people. And I think this is a natural thing when you're a coach, that there's a lot of uh, curiosity, a lot of desire to learn things about people. And um, it's helpful to know what makes other people tick, not as a way to analyze them uh, for our own benefit, but as a way to help them learn about themselves. And this is true individually. And I think it's true for teams and couples and families. What is it that makes us tick? What's possible for us? What do we want together? And those are examples of questions that seem really simple, but they're really hard to answer. Uh, and to me, they open up this landscape of wonder. Yeah, that's great. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about was when, when I said that a topic that follows naturally from curiosity and, and listening is mm -hmm. that... If we're curious, how do we fulfill that curiosity? Uh, well, naturally, of course, by asking questions. And so uh, that is really important. And you're talking about wonder um, and actually expanding that wonder, not just for yourself, but for the people you're in conversation with. Yeah. I, love that. I remember when I was in my coach training, and I've told this story uh, in teaching, but when I was a fresh new student, um, I was really bad at coaching. I had zero skill. Well, of course, it was something completely new. And I remember being in a coaching practice session with a peer student, and I was fumbling badly. And there was a moment when I asked one really good question. And I could see by the reaction of my peer coaching partner that it really stopped her and it made her think deeply about what she was talking about. And I learned, and then I fumbled through the rest of the session, but I had a, a follow-up conversation with her. And, and she told me that that question really changed the trajectory of, of her life at that time. And so to me, it's not about always asking brilliant questions and having the right question. Sometimes it only takes one really good, simple question to shift things. So I think that's a reason to talk about the power of questions. You don't have to get it right all the time. And sometimes you're going to ask a question that completely changes the landscape for yourself or for someone else. That's so powerful to think about what is what is 
the possibility of a question that can change the trajectory of of one's life and um that sounds like enough of an impetus to dive into this topic yeah and i want to point to a source that um we count on um as teachers and i'm thinking about myself and uh jenna kellogg also deeply involved in the development of the upbuild coaching training and those of us on the upbuild team and it's appreciative inquiry it's a it's a way of thinking about asking questions that and, and a way of asking questions that helps uh, highlight what is already working mm. while not stepping over the things that don't work. So from appreciative inquiry, we've learned that the kinds of questions that we ask <laughs> At, deeply influences the answers that we get. And there's a story um, about David Cooper Ryder, uh, one of the developers of Appreciative Inquiry. And there's a story about uh, David Cooper Ryder uh, working with graduate students in the practice of Appreciative Inquiry. And he he split these two groups of students um, uh, into groups who ask different kinds of questions and they went into the same organization. So group A went into uh, the organization and asked uh, questions like, um, what isn't working around here? What are some of the problems you're all facing? Um, what What are the biggest complaints that people have about the organization? Then group B went into the same organization and asked, what are some of the strengths of this organization? Uh, What are some of your proudest accomplishments? What do you say works best? And what are the qualities that help you work together? And so they uh, each group came back and reported out their findings. And in group A, it was, oh my gosh, this uh, this organization is in big trouble. They need help. And from group B, the results were, this is such a strong organization. <laughs> and here are some of the things that they can do next to build on their strength. So, so the lesson is that, that the uh, answer we get is deeply informed by the kind of question that we're asking. If we're looking for the problems, if we're looking for what's not working, we will find it. And if we're looking for what are the strengths and what we can build on, we will find that. Yeah. And who doesn't want that? (laughs) Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, this makes me think, obviously, why interview design is so important. Um, And you said something just, as you were talking about appreciative inquiry that I don't want to s- skip over, okay. you said it's not that we're stepping over the problems. Mm-hmm. And how do you ensure I that we're able to um, ask about the strengths and and expand those and, and give people inspiration around that, but not... A, avoiding what's not working right. and things that really need to be addressed. Well, appreciative inquiry uh, is looking at, it's looking from an asset-based or a strength-based approach where we're looking at, okay, um, we are an organization that uh, has strong relationships. So how do we use that asset of strong relationships to overcome a weakness or Mm -hmm. a place that we want to grow? Mm. So rather than saying, how do we fix this? We're saying, well, we've got this baseline of a bunch of strengths. How do we move from our strengths to, to strengthen this other place? So you're still looking at the areas that need to be addressed but you're you're trying to do it from a place of what is already working really well and how do we leverage that to address 
the areas where we need work. Yeah. So it, it's rather than starting from, you know, zero, you're already starting from a place where you're operating well. It, it, this ha- it happens a lot on teams where, um, you know, there's always a place in a team or in a relationship where there might be complaints or something isn't working all that well. So one of the things we know from appreciative inquiry is that whenever there is a complaint, wherever there is a place that it's simply not working, that tells us we we know what working looks like. Yeah. So one example is our communication really is terrible and we, we really need to work on that. Okay. So that, so appreciative inquiry says it, it sounds like you know what communication working looks like. What does that look like? What does good communication look like? What does strong communication look like? Who are you together when you're communicating well? Mm-hmm. So, so those are examples of powerful questions that come from appreciative inquiry and come from a place of uh, asset-based thinking and looking. Yeah. So you're still addressing the communication challenge, but you're doing it in a very different way than most people or organizations might. Yeah. It's different than asking, why don't we communicate very well well together? Yeah. Yeah. Or what do we need to fix? Or whose fault is it? (laughs) Yeah. Um, What can you share when you ask the, those two questions, the three questions you asked, the first two, um, why is our communication so poor? Uh, you know, what's not working about our communication? What's the issue with those questions? What What's not helpful about them? It's not that those questions are bad. It's just we need to be mindful about where we're looking. So when we look at what's not working, from an appreciative inquiry standpoint, it's helpful to know that so then we can define what would work better. Um, When we ask why questions, we're inviting a lot of story and sometimes some justification for why people made the decisions that they made. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is okay to ask why questions and to hear that story. And sometimes it can put folks on the defensive rather than engaging the creativity to solve it. Yeah. Yeah. So what and how questions can open up curiosity and uh, wonder about what else is possible, what could be done differently or better. Yeah. When I, when I think about appreciative inquiry, the, the name, I often think of the phrase, what you appreciate appreciates. Yeah. And so the idea of being what you appreciate grows where we put our attention will naturally appreciate or grow. And so where are we putting our attention? And yeah. just that phrase also about wh- what you appreciate appreciates has been very helpful for me personally and in, in my coaching um, because it brings awareness to where, what am I appreciating? What am I putting my attention on with, this other person that I'm working with and yeah, in, exactly. in any, not just in a coaching relationship, but in, in any relationship in a parent and child relationship in a, in a colleague relationship. Yeah. I really, I love that. What you appreciate appreciates. And this is, it's true in, in every relationship, even in the relationship with yourself. Um, that, you know, I coach a lot of people who it, it's very human to engage in self-criticism. It's very common to self-criticize, to self-judge. And one of the things I do as a coach is actually help people understand um, what's behind that self-judgment or self-criticism. And and what is it that 
they could appreciate about themselves or focus on as a strength in order to overcome that area of life where they might be engaging in a lot of self-judgment or self-criticism. So for example, um, it could be judging oneself for being really reactive in relationship. And so to get curious and ask what's behind that reactivity, Mm -hmm. what matters that's so important to defend or react to? What's the noble intent behind the reaction? So different kinds of questions that are really looking for, uh, we talked about in the last episode, what's trying to happen. Yeah. So looking for the generative life-giving thing that's actually trying to happen rather than trying to fix the reactivity. Yeah. Great. Very, very helpful. Um, so I want to sort of almost go back to the beginning for a second. And we talked about you shared the story of your co- your own coaching training where you'd ask this one question and you'd said, it's not about the right question um, because we can get stuck in what's the right question? Is there a right question? But what makes a question good to begin with? Or maybe good is also a normative statement. So what makes a question helpful or beneficial? Yeah. Thank you. I love that question. And that's an example of a, a powerful question that causes me and probably some of our listeners to pause a bit and really look for the answer to that question. And and for me, a powerful question opens up the space. And many of us become really uncomfortable in the presence of a powerful question because it opens up the space and it opens up the landscape of our looking. And it's almost like, shoot, I don't know the answer to that question. That's too big. And so a powerful question actually does have that impact where it's like, wow, I don't even know where to begin with that. So in coaching, this is the response we actually want from our clients to have them pause and say, oh, I don't know where to look. And that's okay. Many, many coaches and leaders who ask big open questions get a little bit nervous when they're, when they're met with silence with these questions. But when you wait a little bit and you pause, the question can settle. And people tend to go inside themselves to look for the answer. This is really, really good when you're coaching. It can also be great when you're developing others, when you're in an important conversation with um, a spouse or a loved one. They cause people to stop and look and wonder. It's so funny because we're there's such a tendency to, when you said the question causes you to think because you don't have the answer right away. And I was thinking how often I'm at the ready with my answer to the question before the question is even finished, we're almost trained to have the answers, especially in a work setting. So the question is asked and sort of people are jumping over each other to answer because everybody has the answers versus what is it it would be, feel deeply uncomfortable to not have any answer and need to think about it but that's what you're saying is actually helpful um to ask the questions that people aren't asking themselves yeah this is true in coaching it's also true in leading teams i i was just uh having a coaching session with a leader who um who was uh, 
preparing her team for a, a pretty important event. And she wanted to create conscious relationship and design the alliance with her team about what would help them operate really, really well as a team during this event. And, uh, and, and as she and I were debriefing it, she said, you know, I was asking them the questions uh, to, to create conscious relationship together. And there was a lot of silence, but then there was a lot of rich conversation. And then there was a lot of silence. And then there was a lot of rich conversation. And so this is an example of how everybody was asking themselves questions that as a team, they had never really explored together, but it took them into completely new territory in the way they work together. So this is an example of how asking these powerful questions might be a little bit uncomfortable and there might be some silence and it leads you into new territory as a team or as an individual. Yeah, yeah. And just for everyone's benefit, you mentioned creating conscious relationship. Um, and if for those unfamiliar with that term, could you just say a sentence or two about what you mean? Yeah. Um, so at Upbuild, we talk about uh, creating conscious relationship as a way to create agreements together about how we work together, how we want to be together. Um, rather than operating off of assumptions about each other. So it's a way of being in relationship, and this is any relationship, where our agreements are made explicitly and we create sort of the norms and ground rules rather than fumbling around and, um, and making a lot of assumptions about how it should be or how it wa we want to be. Yeah. We're literally talking about how, uh, what would bring out your best in this relationship, this team, this situation, and here's what would bring out my best. And so how do we work together in that? That's creating conscious relationship in a nutshell. Great. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. So we talked about what types of, what questions what is what are powerful questions and the next question i have for you is where do powerful questions come from if i'm thinking okay i've understood this and i want to ask more powerful questions where do i look to find those powerful questions in myself yeah. I love that question. Where do powerful questions come from? And th there are probably many answers to this as a coach. I uh, I point to two places. One is from what the person you're interacting with just said. So when we're engaged in conversation, we're really listening. There are some things that people say that are really compelling. Um, and so a, a powerful question comes from what that person was just talking about. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in um, you, uh, you and I could be talking about um, a situation that happened to you, and there might be certain words that you say or um, ideas or images that you throw out. And you're just that you're talking about that I could get really curious about, like, what does that mean to you? Or what was it about that that stands out to you? So, so powerful questions come from engaging in the conversation. Mm -hmm. In a coach client relationship, it's focused on what the client is saying. And yet in other relationships, it's more of an exchange where we're asking each other powerful questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other place powerful questions come from, I think, are our own natural curiosity. You know, when someone is talking about anything, they're really talking about something that matters to them. So what curiosity does that spark in me? What is it that you're talking about that has me wonder like, oh, I wonder what that means or I wonder what's important about that. So it comes from my own natural curiosity about, 
about you or about the other? Uh, on the first point you mentioned, thinking how when we get fixated on what's the right question, I may stop listening to what's happening in the conversation and I'm more in my head. And I may be asking a question that sort of the moment passed a few minutes ago because I'm formulating something that has we've already moved on in the conversation. So the idea of being really present to what's happening in the conversation what's being said right now is i think very helpful and then what am i genuinely curious about without yeah. trying to move the conversation in a certain direction and that's hard for that's hard for me that's hard for people because um in some ways it, it it's easy for the curiosity to get trained out of us you know because yeah. i i'll give you one example yesterday i was in this um, our kids' school had a science curriculum event just to share what the science, uh, what they're doing in science in school. And as part of it, they made it, the science teacher made it really interactive and fun. And she did an experiment where she dropped two balls from a certain distance and they, one bounced six, seven times on the table and the other just dropped and stuck to the table, no bounds. Mm. And they looked exactly the same. And so, and through the process, we kind of use the process of this, you know, method of science and the method of inquiry. And the thing that I thought was so interesting is she asked us to start writing, what are the questions that we have about what's going on here? And then this, she waited a few, five seconds and she said, um, you have to write at least seven questions and everyone, it, all the adults in the audience kind of gasp because like, I don't have seven questions. <laughs> I don't have seven questions about this. And, you know, it was, for me, the takeaway was, you know, I, I'm, I, as an adult, I've sort of narrowed, I already think I know what's going on here. So the scope of my questions are limited to, oh, it's, I already know the answer here. So I'm just going to, these are two or three questions that I need to understand. What is the material? And is there any magnetic piece under the table or in the ball? And what the science teacher was saying is it's amazing. She gave examples of 20 questions that kids ask around this same exact experiment. And so similarly in a conversation, when we come in with the thought that, well, I kind of know, I kind of know the answer here, or I know what needs to happen, or I know what this person is thinking, all the assumptions that I'm carrying, that actually kills a lot of the curiosity. And the science experiment was so illuminating in that way, where it's like, wow, even with something like this, I've my my brain is limited. I feel like I only have a few questions. And as we went through the process, it was like, wow, there are a lot more questions here. So how do we how do we open ourselves up to that and really tap into that childlike wonder that no question these questions are not um, well, that doesn't make any sense. So it doesn't make I, I shouldn't even ask it because behind many of those questions are actually lurking the 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 gold. Mm. I love this story so much. Listening to you tell it, my heart feels like it's opening up to this huge space of what happens to us when we think we know and yeah. how it limits our curiosity and our natural inclination to wonder and and how your the science teacher who knows a lot is still able to step into that open space of curiosity um, and wonder. And this, I think, is really possible for us, even uh, when we're an expert in something. Many of us look for what's the right answer. And when I think about powerful questions, especially working with other human beings, whether it's individually or a team, it's not necessarily what's the right answer, but what's true? What's actually true for you? What's true for us together collectively as a team? And mm -hmm. that's, that's way different. That's way, way different.
What's true for me? What's true for you is different than what's right. What's the right answer? So if I'm an executive and I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, yeah, well, there are often times where we have to figure out the right answer. What is the right answer for us as an organization? What's the right decision? We're navigating a lot of difficulty. And there may be even a time where at one of my direct reports, one of my functional leaders comes to me and I think I know the right answer. I know what we need to do. Mm-hmm. How do I engage this idea of powerful questions or does it not apply in those places? If I if I truly think I know the answer, then there's not really any room for powerful questions. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of it is situation and circumstance dependent. And it, so yeah. especially if it's a crisis, an emergency, life or death, um, it's important as leaders to be really clear about what's right, what's in alignment with our mission, our vision, our values, uh, what's actually in alignment with the expectations around performance. So there are a lot of layers to this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes we have to be very, very clear about the right and wrong in certain situations. Where I might vary from that and get uh, more into powerful questions is if it's a situation where developing the capacity of this person as a leader yeah. is important. And where if there's room in the conversation with this direct report to get curious about what are they learning about themselves in this situation? Where do they see uh, they are growing as a result of what happened? What had them make the decision they made or take the action? What was important as a driver? And knowing what they know now, how might they shift moving forward? So it's actually getting deep into those powerful questions and inquiry about the situation that's building them as a person. Yeah, yeah. A lot of what you you're could, talking about is cross actually helping them process their own development and growth in a way that can easily sort of just get brushed aside in the interest of execute, execute, execute. Yeah. So it's a deeper looking and it's also coming from an appreciative inquiry approach, which assumes that there's something of value to be learned and that the kinds of questions that we ask will inform the answer. And mm-hmm. is this a strength-based uh, line of, of asking questions? Yeah. So Mary, what are some ways that we each can practice asking better questions? Asking powerful questions? I've been reading a book called Bring Me the Rhinoceros um, and other Zen Cohen's that will save your life. And this is a fascinating book to me. And there's one idea from the book that just blew me open. And it, uh, the author, John um, Tarrant, was saying, the old teachers thought that not to know is to step into life without repeating yourself. So to not know is the threshold of creating something brand new. Yeah. And so in order to become uh, more comfortable with powerful questions, I would say expand your capacity to not know and be okay with it. So the next time you're in a meeting um, and there's an exploration about a certain idea or solution, if you can actually relax into not knowing, Uh, If there's room for that, you know, obviously you have to have expertise and experience and there's a knowledge base that you walk in with. And if there's room to not know, uh, to, to open yourself to that. Yeah. 
So that's more of a, that's kind of an existential uh, answer to the I, question. I love that. Well, b- before you say anything more, could you repeat that? It's such a beautiful phrase. You said uh, to not to s- not know is to step onto the threshold of not repeating yourself. Is that what? Yeah, the quote. <laughs> yeah, the quote from the book, the old teacher's thought. So these are all the sages and teachers, the old teacher's thought that not to know is to step into life without repeating yourself. Thank you. And when I read that, uh, my heart burst open um, into a space of, wow, life really can be fresh and new. And that there is a threshold of opening if we're willing to not know. And we have what's known um, as, as beginner's mind with yeah. everything. Yeah. Similar to your the, the kid's science teacher. Your science, the science teacher knows a lot. And what is it to actually also not know? Yeah. yeah. It also reminds me of this question that we ask at Upbuild a lot, which is, what am I not seeing right now? And how helpful it is to always carry that question with you, because we so often come from a perspective of, well, this is what I see. (laughs) And so if we can reverse that and ask, what am I not uh, uh, knowing that we're also always not seeing things? So if my attention can be on what am I not seeing? Do I what is the openness and curiosity I come with? So similarly, what am I not seeing or what do I not know here? And yeah. how do I let that drive my questioning? Yeah. What else could be true? What, it is a great uh, question to ask yourself, to put yourself in this place of, of asking more powerful questions. So that's the uh, being, I think the being part of asking powerful questions is be willing to not know. The, the doing, the actual practice, um, there are a couple of things you can do. One is to begin thinking, I wonder. I wonder. Dot, dot, uh, dot. That, yeah, yeah, dot, dot, dot. I wonder. I wonder. So when you're listening to someone you know and you've known them for a very, very long time and they start talking about the same old thing that they've been talking about in your relationship for a very long time, to shift into, hmm, I wonder, and then That's see what so comes good. up out of that. <laughs> I was just picturing that exact scene. <laughs> and I was thinking like, instead of sort of begrudgingly, okay, I need to listen here to all of a sudden, I felt a shift of what, yeah, what do I, add? there's plenty of things I might wonder about. Like, yeah. I wonder why the person is repeating the story. <laughs> I mean, yeah. there's a, a, many more, uh, uh, beneficial wonderings perhaps but i think that's very helpful to start with that phrase and see what am i actually wondering yeah i yeah. wonder and then there's another thing you can try I, um it's seeding your questions with the word what or the word how okay so when you want to leap in with um like well why is it that way or Um, leap in with an answer to stop yourself and then ask what and then dot 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 and see what you're curious about what led us to this conclusion what matters to this person what is it we're really talking about under the surface or how is that for you how could we do this better? How can I learn from this situation? So it's to begin with what or how, and then see what naturally arises from your curiosity. Mm -hmm. And why, now I'm going to ask you a why question. Why, what, or how? (laughs) What's so special about those two sort of starting words? Yeah. What and how are two really great ways to open up the field of possibility. So it opens up the landscape, like what matters here? What else? What's important about that? 
Um, and basically you end up with more open-ended questions. Yeah. They lead you to open-ended questions and they lead you to that place of exploration and inquiry. Mm -hmm. When we, we, as coaches, uh, we tend to avoid why questions because they, uh, unless we're looking for a specific um, why, and sometimes it's important to ask why. And what we know is why questions often will invite a very detailed story about why. Or why may uh, uh, may uh, stimulate some defensiveness or uh, people sometimes when we ask why, they'll feel a little bit judged and they have to go into a long explanation of their reasoning and why. Mm -hmm. And notice that those are the, when we ask why, it will often point the person to the past. Not always, but but often in coaching that shows up. Uh, whereas what and how can open us up to the future, it can also open us up to what matters most without the justifications and the, um, and the possible defensiveness. Excellent. Thank you, Mary. Um, okay. Any final tip before we close this conversation? There's no right or wrong question. And the invitation here is to practice and have fun with it, to allow your natural curiosity and your natural inner scientist have fun with the inquiry. Um, often people, uh, they get a little bit nervous about asking powerful questions because they don't want to seem probing and nosy. Mm. So it's okay to ask permission. Is it okay if I, if I explore this with you or do you mind? I'm really curious about something. Do you mind if I, um, ask you about this? So, um, get that goes back to creating conscious relationship, yeah. just intentionally designing the interaction. Yeah. That's when it's with another person and you can even ask powerful questions of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this conversation, Mary. I am, um, I have, uh, I'm going to carry this directly into a coaching conversation that I have coming up later today. And uh, it really has stoked my wonder. Um, and it really refreshed sort of the power of questions that are genuinely coming from a place of curiosity and really empower the other person to think more deeply. Uh, thank you very much for this conversation. And uh, I'm really hoping that people are able to take a few nuggets and and practice in their lives. Me too. Thank you so much, Vipin. It's always so much fun and a pleasure to be with you and talk about our work. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.